Okay, so it's really important. I think it's really important when we when we start a book of the Bible to talk about the background, the authorship, when it was written, why it was written, all that kind of good stuff. So the book of Acts, as we know, is written by St. Luke, the physician, and he was a companion of St. Paul on a lot of his missionary journeys. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about Luke later, but there's not really that much to know about him other than it was very likely that he was a, um, at one time a slave. He would have been a Greek slave uh, because many physicians were. Uh, so he was probably a freed slave. Um, Luke was a common name for them. And then he probably started out as what is called a God-fearer. So in the early church, a God-fearer is a Gentile who acknowledged the God of Israel. And so they were like interested in the Jewish God. So they kind of went to synagogue-ish and the Jews would take them and teach them about the law, basically. So they did not become Jews, but they did believe in the one true God. Uh, so, and then these God-fearers, many of them converted to Christianity. Um, that was also a very common thing that happened. And he was, Luke was also possibly one of the 70. So when Jesus sent out the 70 ahead of him, he goes, okay, you know, don't take two shirts, just your sandals, walk and stick, go do this, boom. And he sends 70 out and they all come back with all this great news of how receptive people were to the gospel. Very likely Luke was one of them. That's all speculation. We don't know for sure. Then if we look at Acts 1, verse 1, which says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these, he also presented himself alive. And if you look at Luke chapter 1, which says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Okay, so who's Theophilus? And there's a few theories on that. Uh, particularly since Luke addresses him at the beginning of both of his books, which together make like a quarter of the New Testament. So Luke wrote a lot of the New Testament. And calling him O Theophilus in Acts and in Luke calling him Most Excellent Theophilus, those are classical addresses, means of addressing someone in a client-patron uh, relationship. So if you know about uh, in the classical world, you know, the uh, upper classes had clients, uh, and the, the patron did things for the clients. So they, the clients would come to them every morning, and they would have petitions that they would bring him, oh, I need you know, like, to borrow some money for this, or I need to do that. And the patron would be a patron to them. He would help them out. In return, the clients all voted for him whenever he ran for an office. So it was a you know, one hand wipes the other, right? That's the way it was done in, in the Roman Republic and on, on through the empire. Uh, and that happened in the Greek world as well, uh, so, which was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, so you had that client-patron relationship. So these, these uh, clients would also show up, like in the early morning hours, they'd hang out outside their patron's home, even if they didn't need anything, in case the patron needed them to do something. So whether or not you're feeling good that day, you went capped out in front of his house just in case he needed you to do something because that's the way this worked. Uh, so this form of address is a client-patron way of addressing this Theophilus. Uh, so it is very likely that Theophilus was the patron of Luke. In other words, he paid for these documents to be made uh, because making books was expensive. And they did that. I knew I started too early. I should have known better. So we'll talk about that also. How are you? Fine, how are you? You guys didn't miss much. 
So we're just beginning talking about uh, talking about Acts. We talk about how Luke, as we know, is the author, and who Luke was, being a physician, being a companion of Luke, and we'll talk a little bit more about him later. But at the beginning of Luke. Luke's Gospel, the beginning of the book of Acts, he addresses this fellow, O Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. So we're talking about who is this Theophilus guy. Um, and in Luke, Luke refers to Theophilus. Uh, the reason for this being written is that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. So Theophilus is very likely a recent Christian convert. Possibly also a God fear. That was a very common thing. Uh, and not only possibly a recently converted Christian, but probably also a wealthy one if he is, in fact, a patron who's fronting the money for these two books to be written. Uh, and he's not only sponsoring one book, he's sponsoring two. Other theories suggest that Theophilus is not a person, uh, but is an idea. So that because the name Theophilus means friend of God. It can also be translated as beloved of God. Uh, so it could be a title uh, or a generic name applied to those who are going to then read Acts and Luke. And that doesn't hold much water. I mean, it's possible. Sure, it's possible. But uh, the evidence really leans toward Theophilus as an actual person and very likely a recent convert who has forked over the money for these manuscripts to be penned to verify everything he's been taught because you've got Matthew, you've got Mark floating out there by this time. Uh, and they've seen things, they've heard things, they want to verify them. So Luke says, well, I'm going to go very orderly and chronologically and write this stuff down. So that brings us to the dating. Uh, as with all things New Testament, dating is debated. Uh, the dating ranges from the last, the late first century, so that would be like the 90s of the first century, back to around AD 60, that being the earliest dating. Of the late dating, there's probably not much evidence of that, really, uh, according to more modern scholarship, more conservative modern scholarship. Uh, conservative scholarship puts the date as around between 60 and 70 AD, so before the destruction of the temple, the second temple being destroyed in Jerusalem and also before Paul's death because Acts is going to end, Paul's in Rome, Paul's getting ready to be executed, martyred, and it stops. It's like, okay. So it has to be very likely, if, if Paul had died at that point, Luke would have included it. That's kind of an important historical event. Uh, his Luke would have what? Luke would have written it down. He would have included it in his book. So it had to be written, the book had to be completed before Paul was martyred, or he would have written it. Why wouldn't he? He was his traveling companion. They were close. Maybe not. Again, this is all speculation. Uh, but very likely that the book was written before 70. Uh, in the late first century, all the liberal scholars want to put the Gospels later and later and later so that they can say, ah, see, they've been muddled with. That's the whole argument. No scholars of textual criticism or paleography, which is the study of ancient manuscripts, no legitimate scholar uses some of the terms and techniques that those liberal theologians use that have been abandoned now for like over a generation. They just they don't do it that way anymore because it's not legitimate scholarship. But liberal scholars will continue to keep repeating the same things. Oh, you know, the, that stuff wasn't written until the second century after all these people edited it. You can see the evidence. Nonsense. Okay. Um, the neat thing about the dating being between 60 and 70 is that means most of the individuals mentioned in this book were in both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. All of the people that they're being talked about were still alive. Most of them were still alive, which means Luke could interview them. Like, how did Luke, in his gospel, write down when Mary sang the Magnificat when she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth? Well, he went to Mary, and he asked her what happened, and he wrote it down. So eyewitness accounts. You okay? Need some water? I have water. Okay. I just need my inhaler. That's what's 
Oh no. Okay, so that brings us to the purpose of the book, actually the book of Acts and the, book, the Gospel of Luke, is to provide eyewitness accounts of the life of Christ in the Gospel and eyewitness accounts of his apostles in the book of Acts, the early church, particularly John, Paul, Peter, and James, and Stephen. All right. So that brings us now to the audience who is going to be reading and hearing this read to them. So audience and the themes of the book of Acts, which, which basically means what was life like in the first century? Who were these people? What was the early church like? Which is rather interesting. I've got, a, I've got a wonderful commentary on the book of Acts. It's four volumes. Yeah, they're like that. Okay. Volume one, the introductory material before he gets to Acts one, verse one, was like 900 pages. It's a 5,000 page commentary. It's ridiculous. And it's exhaustive. And it's exhausting. The amount of detail and background and so we're distilling out that's one of my primary sources and I use a couple others. We don't have a Lutheran commentary right now uh, for the book of Acts that's being written. I don't know when it's going to be published. Uh, but I've got, there's a Roman Catholic series called Sacra Pagina, which just means holy writing. Uh, the one for the book of Acts is very good, uh, which was recommended by the guy that wrote the Concordia commentary on Luke. Uh, so I thought it was another one of my sources. And it goes into a lot of detail, like things about life back then. So probably the first thing we should talk about is actually writing and publishing a book back then, um, which we could do this anytime we start a new book of the Bible, but I'm doing it with this one, uh, just because of that way it's dedicated at the beginning. It was a good idea for me to write this stuff down. And you, because you, O Theophilus, you know, want to have confidence in what you were taught, and you're fronting me the money, to go around and ask everybody what happened and then write it down. So how did you write a book back then? What did that mean? Okay, now in classical antiquity, so this is going back to like the foundations of Rome and 380, what was the foundation? 380? 753. 753, I can never remember that. Yeah. So classical antiquity, like ancient Greece, but back to the founding of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome, 753 BC through the fall of the empire in around 400 when it finally dissolved completely. During that period, what we call classical antiquity, the maximum length of a book was approximately how much you could sit and comfortably listen to in one sitting. Because that's what they did. When, you, when someone read a book, you didn't read the book, you read it out loud to yourself. Reading meant saying the words as you read them. Okay. And, and we'll talk more about public reading here in a second. So the, the maximum length of a book, which is why these are called books of the Bible, and you're like, but that's not a book, it's only like so much. But the reason for those lengths is the maximum length of a book was about how much you could comfortably listen to in one sitting. And that would be around 20,000 words, it turns out, which would take around two hours for someone to read to you in a good paced speaking voice or, or a good orator would do it in about two hours. Uh, and then in the years between 30 and 35 uh, AD, after the things which are called the Alexandrian Library Reforms, I wish I could find more information about what those reforms were because that sounds cool. But there were these library reforms in 30 to 35 and in these records, it said that the standard, the average 30 to 35 foot scroll contained about 10,000 to 25,000 words. Scrolls were usually between 8 and 12 inches high, uh, with 2 inch to 4 inch wide columns. Right, So about, about that, too, that's about a 2 inch wide column, that'd be like a 4 inch wide column-ish. Okay, so two to four inch wide columns, usually two, uh, 18 to 25 letters per line. Because remember back then, I don't have any books here that have pictures of any manuscripts on it, do I? I do not. Uh, 
if you look at some pictures of ancient manuscripts, you'll see that there are no there is no punctuation. First of all, uh, if you look at Greek, there's no capital letter or there's no lowercase letters. Everything's capital letters because there weren't any lowercase letters yet. And there's no spaces between words. It's just boop, 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 and if the line ended and the word was still going, you just continued on the next line. There is no lines between that. The Romans did it in Latin the same way. That was actually around the time of Julius Caesar, the reforms were coming around to actually put a dot between words because it was very, very, very hard, even for the educated, to take one of these manuscripts and read them because you had to look for the word breaks. All right? So you didn't just read something fresh to somebody, you had to practice it. Uh, but this is the way the text looked. So 18 to 25 letters per line, about 35 to 45 lines per column. Acts contains around 18,500 words by reference. So 20,000 words is what you were comfortable hearing in one setting. Back then, like if we just sat and read through the book of Acts right now, what would happen to our attention spans? It's going to start to wander about chapter 3, I'd say. Okay. All right. Now, authors also tended to maintain a, uh, a sense of symmetry to their writing. So, for example, Luke and Acts, written by the same author, always published next to each other, too. Uh, just like Luke, or uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke is about 19,500 words. Acts is about 18,500 words, taking into account all the textual variants on average. That's about how long they are. They're within about 1,000 words of each other. Very good. Right. So, that's how long a book was. So it's like, why are books of the Bible, like, why is Acts how long it is? That's why. That's about as much as you could stand to have someone read to you at a dinner party. Okay, and then why did Luke have to have a patron, possibly, to pay for this process? Well, first of all, you got to travel and interview people, right? We'll get to that. But also just the act of publishing itself. So if you look at most of the Greek and Roman historians, they began by composing a basic draft, just like you would learn to do in school today. Uh, they would put their material in logical order, have a topical outline, like we're taught to write an essay in school, right? Do your outline, and then you can start doing your five paragraphs, right? Uh, they would put in speeches, okay? Other rhetorical items they want to include. Uh, they would add that stuff at a later time. But they would start with this outline, and then they start to flesh it out. So they had to write it down and then write it down again. Drafts. They had to write drafts. And then Jewish narrative writers who wrote in Greek also began with a rough draft. So it's not just people who read Greek, not just people who read Latin. The Jewish uh, scholars that wrote commentaries and whatnot did the same thing. Uh, they would, our Jewish historians like Josephus, his great history of the Jewish people, they would write drafts, they would write outlines, they'd start to compile their material, then they would actually write what they're trying to write, their chapters and so forth. Um, by ancient standards of publishing, Luke and Acts was both long and expensive. And then if we look at without drafts, without travel, you want me to turn the temperature up? I'd say another degree or two. Sure. I'm sick. I think that ought to... I don't want to be the only one. I'm getting chilled, but... I think you're sitting right under the thing. Yeah. Were you getting a little chilled? No. Yeah, I would no, It's fine. I'm flexible. Okay, so, so even without writing multiple drafts, even without travel time, even without taking in the cost of materials, to do one copy of Luke or Acts would cost about 40 denarii back then, which is about $4,000 today. So publishing was expensive. Paper contrary to popular belief, was not that expensive. There's like, oh, well, you know, papyrus was super expensive. No, it wasn't. It was not that expensive. All the other rigmarole around publishing was expensive. 
the actual paper that you write on papyrus was not that bad. I mean, it was spendy. You didn't just have pads of scratch papyrus to scribble on. But, but the whole idea of telling you all these minutiae details about this is the fact that writing a book thus required very careful forethought, careful arrangement to communicate thoroughly, clearly, and accurately what you are trying to tell people. And that's especially if Luke intended this to be, which he did, a foundational document, like for example in Luke 1, 4, where he says, that is where he says, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you've been taught, speaking to Theophilus, right? It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you've been taught. So it's like, here's your custom gospel guy. So it's got to be done carefully. Okay, so doing this for the community as well, not just his patron, but his patron is paying to have this done for the community, for the church at large. And how long would would it take? Like months to for a scribe to um, copy all of this? I don't remember. I've got it written in the notes somewhere. I just don't remember off the top of my head. But we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that shortly, actually. Uh, talking about some other ancient historians, the historian Pliny uh, wrote that uh, writing a thorough history could consume an enormous amount of time. Historians might even die before their work was complete, he said. And then he wrote elsewhere, to finish a literary work often required shutting out other social demands to focus on their writing. Meaning, to focus on their writing, they had to just drop everything and you went hermit mode, full hermit mode. You know, Stephen King on the mountaintop, and write, and don't do anything else so that you actually get it done. So it was a big deal. Uh, then in rhetoric, which was something we used to teach people, <laughs> and we don't anymore, but the art of rhetoric, the organization of the material thoroughly informed what an educated hearer and reader would evaluate so say that again. So when in rhetoric, the organization of the material thoroughly informed the way that an educated hearer and reader would evaluate a work. Therefore, a writer could not ignore it. So you're judged not just on what you wrote, how you wrote it, the way you wrote it, the literary devices you used, the rhetorical devices you used to write it, that all informed an educated hearer on do you know what you're talking about or not? Is this, you know, is this is this legitimate? Is this done well? Is this good? Uh, because you would think, well, a history book that just gives me the facts, it's a good history book because it's just telling me the facts. This is the most boring thing you've ever read, right? You've got, like, I can name like, a Roman history book I had in college. It was the driest, worst history book I've ever read. Now, there are others that are actually engaging to read because it makes it seem like a story. Now, this guy, does he have all the historical facts in it? Yes. Is it fun to read? No. You look it up like you look something up in a dictionary, but you don't go, oh, I feel like reading skull art again today. No, you don't, because it's awful. I, mean, ugh. I, would, I would rather chew cardboard. Hmm. Than, it doesn't than, have anything to do with style, does it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's part of style. Also part of style. Um, which, of course, style was more formal. So... Do you get like like author personality style coming out? Not so much back then, uh, but you can. You can. You know, in fact, if we do uh, just real quick on the Book of Luke, you know the way Luke ordered things, the way he designed the gospel to have this focus leading to the cross, ultimately leads to Jerusalem which we'll talk about more because that's pertinent for Acts too. You know, he, he put things in rhetorically to show Christ as an epic, heroic figure and also the Son of God. I mean, he's not just making him out to be like a Lord of the Rings cool guy. 
he, he's showing the truth, but he does it in such a way that he shows Jesus as this epic hero sent to earth to save us. Uh, whereas, you know, Mark, Matthew focuses more on his humanity. John focuses on his divinity. Luke makes him out to be more like a Homeric epic hero. All of them teaching us that he's the son of God who was sent to save us. But you get that kind of style coming out. Uh, Luke, beginning in Galilee, ending in Jerusalem. Acts, beginning in Jerusalem, going out to the world. So that's his big, big picture. Everything goes to Jerusalem, comes back out of Jerusalem on Pentecost. Okay, so a writer couldn't ignore this stuff because these people that listened to this kind of thing, me like your average Joe hearing it read in church, not necessarily, but these people who are hearing it at a dinner, dinner party because that was the entertainment in those days. You know, some people had dancing girls, some people read a book too, and they were equally beloved. People loved this stuff. It was a different time. Uh, people, the upper classes were very literate and very fussy. Uh, so a person having this read there kind of puts this author on a map, kind of. We'll talk about that also. Um, so a writer couldn't ignore any of these things. Now, revision during the process of composition was a standard practice, just like we do. We make revisions. Uh, and historians often followed an earlier historian in their first draft, which that speaks to some of these uh, higher critical Bible scholars that just say, well, you know, there was this source material, Q, and the Gospels got this document, Q, and wrote their Gospels. Like, well, whichever was first, Matthew or Mark, probably Mark, Matthew undoubtedly would have read it and gone, oh, yeah, that's how he did that. That's a good way to start I'll give me my outline. And Luke is going to look at Matthew and Mark and go, that's how they did that. Good, that gives me my beginning outline. It was normal for a historian, and yes, the Gospels are history. They're telling things that actually happened, right? So historians often followed an earlier historian's outline in their first draft. That's just how you got started. Uh, so it's like, oh, yeah, you can tell that they copied. They didn't copy. They modeled it after because that's just how they did things in the ancient world. Now then, publication. Publication is a different word back then. Publication most often began with reading it in public. All right, so the well-to-do incorporated readings as entertainment following a dinner and, or a banquet or party. So the wealthy employed their own readers, guys that are trained to stand there, read this stuff so that they can find the breaks in the lines so they know how to actually read it in public without sounding like a stuttering idiot and actually be fun to listen to, right? Because somebody reads something in a monotone and like mispronounces stuff and loses their place, you're not going to follow the narrative very well and you're not going to be very entertained. If somebody has a great speaking voice and it's very engaging without putting too much flair into it to be over dramatic, but not to be monotone and boring, that's fun to listen to someone read like that, right? So these wealthy people actually employed in their employ someone in their household. His job was be reader, lector. Okay. Educated members of churches or servants of the family who hosted a home church. Remember the house churches are how the church got started. Probably read from Luke and Acts after the Lord's Supper at uh, a dinner. And we can look at some little New Testament citations of that real quick. We look at 1 Corinthians 10.21, which says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Why did I include that reference? I don't know. I usually remember why I included these later. 11.20. Oh, okay. Right, so you can't partake from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. So how do we do that? We continue to listen to the word. So 11, verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together, it is these, this is Paul criticizing the people who are going out and getting drunk or getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, at the dinner, 
before they have the Lord's Supper when they're doing church at the house churches in the evening. So therefore you meet together. It's not the Lord, you're not eating the Lord's Supper for when you're eating, each one takes his own supper first and one is hungry and the other is drunk. What, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to, in other words, his epistles. That the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread and he goes through the Lord's Supper. So he's talking about how he has communicated his words, the words of the Lord to you in his letters, which you now read because doing worldly stuff was drinking from the cup of the devil. And then Jude, verse 12. I always leave Jude because it's like one page. Jude, uh, Jude verse 12. Ah, yes. Yeah, another warning to the church about being ungodly. Um, these, are men, there are, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. She's talking about doing all kinds of terrible stuff. Again, I don't know why I included these. Uh, oral recitations at banquets and other social gatherings provided one form of publication. That's what we we're talking about. Uh, but written publication included not only the reading of a work at such occasions, but sometimes in wider circulation. So sometimes you have the copy that they're reading there, and sometimes it meant they made some other copies too and distributed them. Uh, hearers or readers of wealth who heard a reading and liked it at the dinner party, and this is how the marketing starts, right? The, the uh, uh, promotion of a writing starts. So you're at a dinner party, you hear the reader reading something you like, and you have money. So you employ a copyist to make a copy for yourself because there are no Xerox machines, right? There's no printing press, there's no, all this is done by hand, which is why it's so spendy. So members of the wealthy elite could engage copyists to circulate the book in that way, even further expanding it, going, okay, hey, this is good. More people need to hear this. I am going to pay for more copies to be made. So they like, hey, here, here's a copy of this I made for you. Read it at dinner because I think you'll like it. So because only the elite provided access to this manner of lit literary reception, Writers might hope to have such friends who had the means to circulate a book under, among other members of the elite. Sometimes the author secured the favor of such an individual with the dedication that we heard at the beginning of both of these books. You know, it seemed good to me, O Theophilus, most worthy Theophilus. So that's why we, we, it sounds very much like this is a patron of Luke's who is fronting the coin to have these treatises written down and then published. And also, you know, a writer or an author can do something more elaborate. These long works like Luke and Acts are. I mean, Philemon, like one page, right? It's one page in our Bible. It's like probably two leaves of papyrus. And it's done because there's not much to it. But that's a book. It's just not long. Luke, Acts, pretty long, right? About 40,000 words between them. Right. In classical antiquity, a work was often released in stages also. And we saw that, you know, you see that in the Victorian area too. You saw where, where people uh, published novels in installments, right, in series. And you, you saw part of it, and then next month, the next part, and next month, the next part. Dickens. Especially when you got paid by the word, well, like I, Dickens. Yeah, I've just been reading a book exactly like yeah. that. I mean, it ends in the craziest place. Tune and in next it, week. It, and you can't wait to get the second book mm -hmm. just to find out what happened in the first book, you know? Right. You know, and even story, shorter stories like H.P. Lovecraft, a lot of his stuff was published in installments. Um, like a novella that's maybe 100 pages. And it was four chunks, like 20 pages each. Yeah, well, that's how they get you to keep watching TV show, right? Cliffhanger. And then come back next week so that we can 
blow more commercials into your head? Yeah, so these were often released in stages even back then. Now, an author with very elite connections can even work proactively, which I don't think they used that word back then, but they could work pro proactively by reading a work of their own first to these elite, super elite friends, right? It's like, hey guys, I got a command performance for you. Oh, Theophilus, wait till you hear this. Maybe, I don't think Luke was actually written that way, but that's people with very elite friends would have done this. So they also, they're friends. They're going to be supportive of you, right? They're going to be receptive to whatever it is you wrote because you're their friend. So you would listen and then listen to a more general public audience that could perform this work orally, which gives you feedback, which informs what do I got to do to this to make it more publishable, right? And that allowed revisions to take place and whatnot. Excuse me for interrupting, but okay. So, what was the educational focus during this time? Because you're going to need, if if you have people writing, mm -hmm. you're going to need people who know how to write. Mm -hmm. And not only do they have to know how to write, they have to know what the words are. Mm -hmm. So you're you're going to need a a lot of that, and then you're going to need people to be the readers. Mm -hmm. So was there a, a focus on education where people learned how to read and write? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, and in fact, the wealthy hired you know tutors for their children, or they had Greek slaves who were educated men from Greece, and they would come and teach their children. Uh, so teaching rhetoric was one of the big things. So reading, writing, of course. You know, they, they would be taught to read Latin and Greek uh, because you had to read Latin for history and you had to read Greek for commerce. So were the school were there schools? Was it a public <coughs> education or was it more private? It was more it was more of a private school type model. I mean the average laborer didn't educate their children, they couldn't afford it. Uh, so there was no public schools necessarily. At different times and in different places, I'm not saying for sure they didn't have that. In fact, I think in a couple of places they did. But I can't speak to it factually because I'm not versed in it. Which it just seems just, obvious you're going to need a lot of but people yes, who are the, educated. The, the wealthy were absolutely educated, including girls. Um, well, they, and they had to even educate their slaves, slaves, slaves if they um, expected their slaves to teach the children. Well, they bought the slaves specifically to teach. These people were already educated oh, from wherever okay. they came from. Um, but yes, if they wanted to make their slave better at their job, they would educate them to be able to do better business for them. So absolutely. But uh, yeah, educating children, it was basically was reading, writing, more than one language. Uh, and then the art of rhetoric, the art of arguing especially in the Roman Empire, because if you are, you know, if you are a elite Roman young man, your whole life is climbing the, the, the uh, Persis, Persis, Persis or Nora, the, the social ladder, you know, so you got to start out here as a, uh, what, praetor? And then Reader, aedile, aedile, and then work your way up to consul, so that you can get a fat province after your council as a proconsular uh, assignment, and then you can go make a lot of money. So it was debating or like court. <laughs> Lawyering, court. actually. It was the okay. lawyers. Yeah. Julius Caesar was famous for his oration, but it, he All got that way by... Well, every single one of them was a lawyer. Yeah. That was just, you so, were a lawyer. Yeah. If, if you, you wanted to be known for your rhetoric, Mm -hmm. and you wanted to move the population, you picked cases, and you played to the crowd, not just to the jury. And people would come to Rome, and I mean the regular people, to listen to the lawyers present their case. That was an entertainment for them. Yep. And that's how you got known. Yep, so their educational system was very regimented and very specific, and then of course you learned like military history, that kind of stuff later. Uh, and then, we should go back to that. Well, if you actually look at if you look at the classical uh, classical <laughs> education, classical liberal arts education in Europe or America, is it based on that? It's the exact same thing. 
So you've got reading, you've got writing, you've got geometry, math, astronomy, music. Those are all the core things. There's like four for liberal arts, there's four, and then there's trivium, reading, writing, letter, rhetoric. And then you have the quadru quadrivium, which is uh, astronomy, mathematics, music, and more language stuff, basically, debating, uh, all that. Uh, so that you had a well-rounded well liberal arts education. You know, there's no science per se yet in this part of the world. Uh, the Arabs are making leaps and bounds eventually, but uh, not so much in this area. Uh, so yes, they were very educated. Uh, it was a thing. Uh, so, and, and I would say better educated than we are because we can't write a complete sentence half the time anymore. It's just times have changed. It's not as important anymore. Can't spell either. True. So it's bull checks for. Yeah, exactly. Or grammarly for writing. Grammarly is wrong a lot, by the way. Okay, so. Anyway, yeah, so you'd be able to have uh, work circulated in more than one form. You could have several drafts out there at a time. It could get kind of confusing. So if you ever wondered, why are there so many different varying manuscripts of books of the New Testament? Did you ever stop to think that maybe they were drafts? Because <laughs> we can't tell them what they are necessarily if they're complete and a lot of them are fragments. So it's like, why are there variations in the New Testament documents? Have you never done a draft? Have you never made a revision? That's not why all of them. It's just because copyists make mistakes too. But that's Or take liberty something. And, yeah, and that's a different topic. Yeah, how do you know you don't have a draft? So yeah, there's reasons why all these variations show Yeah, an author could also do something called a preprint, just like scientists today. If you are getting ready to publish a paper, uh, but you know that your rival at another university is hot on the same topic, and somebody has to establish priority of who gets the discovery, you fire off a preprint. It's like, here's what I discovered. Don't have all of the details in it, but I discovered this. Evidence to follow. You have to establish, you've got to mark your territory. You have to establish this is mine. I got there first, uh, which you wouldn't think that happens, but it does all the time. Which is why every journal has a preprint journal too. So there's polymer preprints, there's macromolecules. It's every journal. There's a preprint journal that goes with it. So it's like the Cliff Notes, early draft, early going. They do that in science today. They did that back then too. So here is a preprint of the book I'm writing. Check it out. What do you think? Maybe it'll fund me to make it longer and better. But they would also say, okay, don't publish this beyond you. This is for you. Like getting a, uh, what do they call that? When you get a pre- the reader's edition? I mean, the no, 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 when you get a like, draft edition of a script, but you're not allowed to just show it to anybody else. There's a name for that, like a screenplay for, for a movie. Yeah. I can't remember what that's called. But yeah, you would get, they would tell them, okay, don't, uh, don't let anybody else read this yet. It's not ready for prime time, right? Uh, but give me feedback so that I can polish it. And Cicero, the great orator, wrote uh, about that process of sending a preprint, limiting it to one reader, and then getting the feedback to polish it up to make it better for final publication. Then after a copyist uh, completed a book, copying it from oral dictation, then that uh, would be error checked. They would look at it, they proofread it, just like we do. Author would then double check it that the corrected copy was the one that got sent to the reader. It's like we have historical documents talking about procedures to make sure you make sure you send the corrected copy to the guy. Do do we have people today that can read those old manuscripts that way? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, like, read to say, oh, this is a draft, or this was, you know, they can't date them that close. Uh, but you absolutely, that's a whole branch of science called paleography. That's all they do is look at, they're archaeologists of manuscripts, basically. Yeah. So they can authenticate them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can authenticate them, they can date them. Uh, and I'm just speaking about biblical manuscripts right now, but yeah, they have, that's a thing. There's a thing, the guys dedicate their lives to studying this stuff, so yeah. 
uh, and you've got it in all periods of history. It's crazy. You wouldn't think there'd be that many specialists, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of people who do that. Yep. And then other, just other thoughts. An author might uh, even claim that a book was written for a specific reader's attention, kind of like Luke. Oh, Theophilus, it's a good idea for me to write this down for you, which you know because you're paying for it. But, uh, but the, they might do this preprint, dedicated to the guy they gave the copy to, and goes, hey, I'm writing this for you. But would you read it? Tell me what you think. So we can make it better. So he dedicates it to him in that way. Um, so they can initially distill it down to what they actually want to say, how they want to say it, and then, boom, they'll publish it. Some scholars believe that Acts originally circulated in multiple editions. Uh, their argument being that diverse editions helps to explain the te textual tradition, which I touched on earlier. So we call that variata. Uh, this doesn't have an apparatus. Grab a different one. So on one side it's got Greek, and on one side it's got English. Book of Acts, chapter 1. Not much on each page. Really? Side, this is the only side we're paying attention to. So you've got the Greek text, and this is verses 1 through 8 only. Down here, you got a bunch of jibber-jabber that also looks like Greek, because it's in Greek, and it's got weird symbols and all kinds of things on it. You can pass it around. This is called the apparatus. It sounds all official and ominous, doesn't it? So the apparatus tells me all the textual variations of the other documents around for Acts. So it does this for the whole New Testament, the major ones. Uh, so these symbols tell me, is it a papyrus? Is it a vellum? Is it, what kind of document is it? What number is it? Uh, which then there's an index. You can tell who, what museum, what institute has this document. Uh, and it tells you, oh, you know, this manuscript has this, this manuscript has that. Spelling mistakes, word changes, what have you. So everybody says, oh, you know, there's a lot of copying errors in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, we got them documented. We don't hide it. It's right there. Anybody can read it if they want to learn to read Greek. Does the paper type date these documents? Yeah, the paper type can date or the, the material it's made out of. Uh, but like how closely they can date, that's not that close. You know, it's not like they can date this. Oh, this was, you know, this was done, you know, in the year 23 and this was written in the year 24. They can't do that. They can hit it within a few decades, a couple decades. I was going to say 20 to 30 years. Yeah, so saying like the Acts was written between 60 and 70, that, that's tight. That's a tight dating. Uh, but they use other than the actual material itself, because they're not going to like carbon date it. They do carbon date documents, but it gets you in the neighborhood. Then you have to look at clues in the text itself mm -hmm. to figure out when it was actually written. So you can pass that around. It shows you all the different variations. So there were probably multiple editions, which explains some of these things which we call the variata, the differences. Uh, but regardless of where the variata come from, uh, the standard process of examination or revision suggests that significant and long narrative works, such as Acts, were not lightly cranked out and distributed. They were carefully composed, carefully revised from the original sources of information into a cohesive narrative. That's the way ancient history was written. Uh, and in and, and the ancient, our, our biblical documents were written. So it leads to us to a conclusion that Luke, and by extension the other New Testament authors, would have had plenty of opportunity to identify and correct 
or explain some of the points in their work. This is kind of an abstract point I want to make. But it leads to the conclusion that Luke and other New Testament authors had plenty of opportunity to identify and correct or explain points that they made in their writing that modern readers find difficult or curious why they said that or how did that, what did that mean? That, that uh, like that's a difficult passage. It's like, hmm, if the ancient writer thought it was that difficult, they had time to fix it. So it wasn't difficult for when these ancient people listened to it. It wasn't difficult for them. It's difficult to us because we're 2,000 years removed sometimes from this stuff. Um, but no amount of editing or revising can prevent every instance of misreading. Okay? So people are still going to misinterpret. People have been misinterpreting the Bible since they started writing the Bible. Right? Like, why did John write John? Because people started misinterpreting the first three books saying Jesus wasn't God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they don't really emphasize Jesus being God. So John says, ha, ah, no, we're going to fix this. Let me tell you some other things Jesus said and did. So you can't, no matter how much you edit, no matter how careful you are, you cannot prevent a reader from not reading what you wrote the way you meant to say it. You know, the, the, make them understand exactly what you meant to say. That's going to go, come out in their head the same way it came out of you. You can revise to your blue in the face. You can't cure that. Okay, and this uh, Dr. Keener fellow uh, stated that Luke may have begun, this is his conclusion from studying this for like a lifetime, Luke may have begun by producing a rough draft of his two-volume work. So he may have had Luke and Acts, rough draft, both at the same time going on. Uh, it's not like he finished Luke and then a few years later he did Acts. He may have been working on them simultaneously. It's possible. It would be common for such a work to be written that way. Or possibly he did the gospel first with a draft of Acts attached until it was more polished. He would then receive feedback on it through public readings and banquets, uh, especially the Christian banquet, which we call the Lord's Supper. So they, they would meet the church met, they would eat a meal, they'd do church, they'd have the Lord's Supper, they would hear the latest of whatever's been read and sent to the churches. Right, because they don't have a Bible yet, it's still being put together. Right. Then an elite sponsor or a hoped for sponsor, like we talked about, like this fellow Theophilus, could provide the work wide circulation, which, is, um, which uh, in you know indicates that, that that person could afford to have more copies made. All right. So Luke sends this draft to his friend Theophilus, who is, you know, fronting the money, and Theophilus is going to, you know, is a, a new Christian convert, and he's like, this is important. God's given me this well. I'm going to make sure this story is everywhere, so he could afford to do that, whoever Theophilus is. Uh, time is it? I have no idea how long I've been talking. Uh, of course. It's going that's impossible, right? Saying it's between 60 and 62. They can date it that close if they really want to start nitpicking details in the text. And then that's what scholars argue about. Otherwise, they don't have anything to do. Yeah, so so yeah, whoever wrote that probably has textual evidence. This indicates that it's written between 60 and 62. And then 10 other guys in his bowling league are going to argue with them about that stuff for decades. That's what they do. But yeah. Yeah, that's probably that's pretty tight. I'd like to know how they came to that. Okay, so let's talk about ancient doctors. All right, because Luke's Luke's a physician, right? Now we can't be sure about the extent of Luke's medical knowledge, or even if it, and when it was a help to Paul, or even if it ever hurt Paul. Right? We can't really talk about what kind of doctor Luke was or what his training was because we don't know. Now, so Lucian, how, huh? How do we know he was a physician? What evidence do we? There's textual evidence. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Then uh, Lucius 
Arninius Seneca, also known as Seneca the Younger, around the year 65, was a Roman Stoic philosopher. <laughs> Stoicism held that the path to happiness was to be rational and to be social beings at every moment. That, that was the theory of Stoicism in a nutshell. So this guy Seneca was a contemporary of Paul, okay? And was of the opinion that earlier physicians, I'm dating Luke this way, like when Luke was a physician. So this guy Seneca, who was a contemporary of St. Paul, wrote that his opinion was that earlier physicians before when Seneca lived, which is around 65, he was of the opinion that earlier physicians lacked the knowledge of the doctors of his own time, like presumably Luke, meaning old doctors were not so good, but the ones we got aren't bad because the old ones lack the knowledge we have. And then the manuscript evidence shows that medical books were widely circulated, but there is no oversight. There are no governing bodies. There is not a Galilean medical association overseeing Paul's and Luke's practice. Right? There is no you know, malpractice insurance in, for anything like that. You couldn't sue your doctor for killing your husband just, right? There isn't anything like that in the ancient world. Okay, there's no, no really even governing bodies to provide certification. So it's like you could go to medical school. There were medical schools, especially in, in uh, what are now Islamic countries. They were really at the forefront of medicine for quite a number of centuries. But you didn't get a degree. They didn't have that. That wasn't a thing yet, right? Uh, you couldn't even have academic examination. It's not like there wasn't a board that checked you out and said, okay, we're going to see if you're qualified now. Did you learn anything? Did, are, you, are you safe to go out there and do this stuff? No, there's none of that. All right? Many learned their trade through apprenticeship. It was a trade. It was just like, why, was the, why were the first surgeon barbers? You went to get you know, a haircut and a shave, and maybe your tonsils yanked out. Because the barbers were... Surgeons. Surgeons were not really physicians in those days either. That was a craft. That was something you learned how to do like a mechanic. It was like a car mechanic. You went to get your body work done by these guys. Which in reality isn't too far from the way it really works. But okay. So they learned through apprenticeships under doctors in large urban medical centers, which they did have, like Alexandria, right? Big city in Egypt, Rome, Athens. The biggies, right? Istanbul. Not Constantinople, I can't pronounce it. All right. <laughs> Physicians were frequently slaves. There was a fellow named Charles Worth who observed it's astonishing how often the name of a doctor shows him to be a Greek freedman uh, because they can tell from their names. In medical matters, masters were known to submit to. Their slave physicians, because your doctor knows best. So it's like, okay, you're my slave, but you're also my doctor, and you're telling me to do this. I trust you. Because you had those kind of relationships between a slave and master in that society back then, uh, when your slave was someone of status, like a physician. Um, slave or free, a physician would have been educated and of a higher status than. in most important aspects than free peasants. So if you're just a peasant, you know, patch, you know, toiling in your patch of dirt, right? And you're a slave, but you're a physician. You're still a slave, but you're a physician. Your social status is up here. That was, that was a good thing to be. Um, a physician who lacked local competition, <laughs> according to a, uh, a Roman historian called Dio Chrysostom. He said he could acquire considerable wealth if he was if he was plying his trade in an area without direct competition, and he could earn a very large salary. And according to a guy, a historian named Jeffers, if Luke is a Greek version of the Latin name Lucius, it would suggest that Luke may possibly have been a Greek slave of a Roman, and 
received the master's name after being free. If that were the case, then Luke would also have been a Roman citizen, which is kind of important. So if you are a freed Roman slave, if your master frees you, uh, which they often did when they died in their will, they freed their slaves because they were good, faithful servants for many years, that would also confer on them citizenship, which is a big deal in the Roman Empire. Uh, and that would have also explained Luke's interest in the synagogue of the freed persons, which is, uh, we'll see that in Acts chapter 6, verse 9, and the privilege uh, awarded to him in accompanying another Roman citizen who is a prisoner to Rome, i.e. Paul. Uh, Luke would have been welcome in Rome also. Most physicians in Rome were foreigners. And as such, they were among the most prized foreigners in the city, said this historian Suetonius. Um, it was a big deal even back then. It's a big deal to be a doctor now, right? But it was a really big deal back then. Uh, so even if you were a slave, even if you were a foreigner, you were welcome wherever you went because you were a doctor. Jewish people recognize God as ultimately the healer, but at least some of the Jews of Palestine in those days with a more widespread education made use of physicians. You know, they were aware that there was a thing called a physician and that you could use them to fix things sometimes. Uh, and the great Jewish historian Josephus recorded that. Also, uh, Sirach, who is a biblical author in square quotes, he's actually a book of the Apocrypha that he wrote, um, which Lutherans from time immemorial have read. It's a good book to read. Um, the book of Sirach, chapter 38, verses 1 to 9, praises physicians as their, and their medicine as instruments of God. Kind of a neat thought. Then according to a historian called Goodman, although Galilean physicians probably lacked the formal training that Greek physicians would have received. Uh, they adopted some Greek medical practices. However, Galilean physicians, like Greek ones, mixed genuine medical knowledge with what we today would regard as superstition, which you see that in the development of the medical field. People have superstitions, and now medicine's coming along, and, well, you know, you were raised with your superstitions, but now you're learning medicine, and there's going to be a hybrid of that for a while until the superstitions die off, right? It's like, well, you know, you, you have to put a slice of onion in your left shoe under your bed if you have headaches. And if you do that for a week, you'll be cured. If you, and if you don't do it for a week, you're going to, you know, if you do it in your right shoe, you will die. Don't do that. But if you put it in a slice of onion, or I'm making that up. That There were traditions like that in Eastern Europe, like for like the Czech Republic, Slovakia, there's all kinds of folk legends of like stuff you would do. You know, like, people really did that? <laughs> okay. Well, or that's, that's typical. But folk medicine, in America, right? Folk medicine, yeah. yes. Especially. The, you still have it. We still have sure. it. In areas where they might not have access to a doctor. Yeah. And other parts of folk medicine, we actually find out later. It's like, there's actually, they didn't know there was real science behind it. But, it's like, but a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff actually turns out to be legit. <laughs> So, willow bark aspirin. Hmm? Willow bark. There is a lot of stuff that comes from aspirin. trees that is really handy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a little bit about doctoring, what we know about doctoring from back in those days. They also made house calls. They did make house calls. Well, actually, a lot of these doctors lived in the house. You know, they, they were the they were the slaves of their man. They were their personal physician of these guys that maybe had a big household. So yeah, you know, quite a bit different, quite a bit different, way different culture than what we are used to. So now we got to talk about because when we interpret books of the Bible, as we've talked about previously, what the book says has to mean has to mean the same thing to the original hearers in the first century as it does to us today. If it meant something different then and something different now, do not sit and listen to me flee because I'm teaching you wrong. It's got to mean to God's people throughout time and space the exact same thing. That word does not change. But 
our understanding of a culture informs why they said the things they said, or why, why this, or why, why this turn of phrase? Does this mean what we think it means? Do we read it literally, or is there something going on here? All this history stuff helps us do that better. So personality in the culture of the first century is our new section. We're talking about. So what was life like in the setting of the book of Acts? How did their worldview differ from ours? Because our 21st century American focus is on solving problems. That's what we do. Something's not right, and we fix it. And if we don't like the way something is, we change it. Okay? Individualism. If something in my life I don't like, it's up to me to change it. I don't rely on other people. Right? Realizing my own individual potential. If I don't like where I'm at in life, that's nobody's fault but mine. I need to work harder to get the things I want, to change my status in life. Okay? That's 21st century, 20th century, 19th, 18th century American thinking. That's a modern thinking, particularly American. Okay? Luke and Acts, the world of Luke and Acts, looks at gender-specific values, which we better not say that out loud today. There's women's work and there's men's work in those days, right? Okay? Gender-specific values concern for public reward and honor based on a very deep-rooted status system. So, you know, social status. Our nearest frame of reference today for what that world is like is probably tribal life in sub-Saharan Africa, where what you do affects the group, and what you do and what you accomplish socially for the group elevates or lowers your status. So how you are contributing to the life of the tribe is are you a chief or are you a peon? That's the closest like social structure that's still existing today that's like that. Because we don't, it's not like that here. The church is supposed to be kind of like that. But in the Mediterranean in the first century, they had very traditional, very stable social structures. The idea of individualism was completely alien to these people. All right? The verb to be was, okay, I am. So we're going to go full-on Greek crazy philosophy here a second. So, you know, I think, therefore, I am, right? So the idea of being was a self-perceived, distinctive whole set within relation to other wholes within a given social and natural background that's pure sociology language. So what in the world did I just say? So I am a distinct whole individual set in relation to other whole individuals in a societal and natural background of the environment we find ourselves in. It's all about social order, social contribution. It is completely social based, not psychological. That's how we think today. Okay? It's called dyadic. It, they perceived their roles and their status of clans and families as well as within them individuals and their work as being ordered by God. So God has put everything in this order, and that's how it is. This is how clans are. This is how families are. This is how individuals are. That's the way of thinking in this world where Luke and Acts is taking place. Now, we think psychologically. How do we feel how do I feel about how I fit in society? How do I feel about what's going on in society? In that world, it's like, what cares what you feel? What do you do? What are, how do you fit with this group? How are you contributing to what's going on? And that contribution and that role, that vocation, is ordained by God. God created that. And you are in it, and so you do it. So then we have to understand how important the idea of honor and shame, and we'll see these themes in Acts. We'll see the, you see these themes in the Gospels too. Uh, but I'm highlighting them because it just seems like the book of Acts is a good place to highlight it, talking about this first century history. 
So this idea of honor and shame of morality and deviance, virtue and value. And then again, for these Mediterranean people, the idea of the cursus honorum in Rome, this ladder people climb socially to get richer and richer and more and more powerful and important, that was foreign to them too. Yeah, Rome, the Roman Empire rules the world right now. And these guys are ladder, ladder climbers, right? That whole idea of what these Romans do was nuts to these people. So you go into the Greek-speaking world, to the Mediterranean, to Palestine, even though, the, even though the Romans like rule the province, it's like, okay, yeah, we kick up taxes to them, but yeah, what these guys do is nuts. What do they do? They go all over the world doing this stuff, and it's all for them. They don't care about the family. They don't care about the group. They don't care about us. That's the thinking of these Mediterranean people in the first century. So the Romans were equally just nuts. They didn't get it. Like, we don't understand what they did. So now you see the friction a little bit between like the Jews and the Romans, right? Because their worldviews and their idea of society is completely different. So we'll talk about a little bit of the difference between the world of Luke and Acts and contemporary America. So we'll talk about activity. The idea of activity in the Mediterranean world is the activity of being. You are a father. You are a carpenter. You are a citizen. You, know, you are this, you are that, you are a father, you are a son, you are, right, are, like Lutherans talk about vocations. You are those things. In America, it's what do you do? What do you do for a living? What do you do on the weekends? What do you do for fun? It's all about what you do, not who you are. What do you do? How do you do it? How do you get the money to do it, right? Okay, so that's a difference, big difference between their world and our world. Relationships in the ancient world are collateral. You know, everything is, there's interdependence. Everything affects, all relationships affects our relationships with other things because it all has to do with the society. In America, it's all about me. Like, I might work with nice with the group today to get what I want. It's individualism. That's the modern perspective. The Mediterranean first century perspective, collateral. Time, completely different concept of the flow of time. Now, I'm not talking about time travel. I'm talking about in the Mediterranean world, you focused on the present by looking to the past. History is important. In America, we look to the future by focusing on right now. How do I get where I want to be based on where I'm at right now? I don't care what happened yesterday. Being a little facetious, but when, you, when sociologists talk about this stuff, that's how they talk about it. So that, that there's a different concept of how you live your life based on time. You look to the past to see how to be in the present. Kind of like walking backwards through life. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know where you've been. You don't right, know right. where you're going. You just know where you've been. And we know what happens when you don't study your history, right? Then there's the idea of man versus nature. Right? We're here in the world, in the Mediterranean world of the first century, you are subordinate to nature. Nature is a force. Nature is from God. You, know, you are subordinate to the limitations of the natural world. Now, in the modern world, we've mastered that. Right? We are in control. We, are, we kind of took that, you know, be fruitful, multiply, you know, and dominate a little too literally, maybe sometimes. Right? Mastery over the world. We reshape the world in our image. And then human nature, the way you look at human nature is completely different. Because in the Mediterranean world, you know, you had you know mixed natures in people, saint centered duality, right? You had good and evil, but you absolutely had evil. In contemporary America, it's kind of Human nature is neutral. It's neutral. It's all balances out. There's no good and evil. There's that more postmodern nonsense, right? It's like there's, eh, I mean, what's your good might be evil to me. Eh, neutral. Do you know what word that's not in the Bible? Neutral. There is no mention of neutral in the Bible. There's no concept of neutrality in the Bible. Just throwing that out there. Does say lukewarm, though. 
Mm -hmm. You want you either hot or cold. Hot or cold, right? No, you can't be wishy-washy. You can't be on the fence. You can't be neutral. You can't be. You can't be Switzerland, okay. right? The other force or against us. Yeah. Good. City meant something different back then too. Although they had big cities. Huh? Like, where was there a million people in Rome about this time, first yes. century? It's a good sized city, the size of Cleveland. Has Cleveland got a million people still? No. Not even. Rome, bigger, bigger than Cleveland. Because the word city, the word, and this is sociologi sociological language that the word city means something different back then than today. <sighs> But mm, socially, I don't think it's that different. Back then, a city meant you had regions of sharply defined areas of distinct social states, and you didn't go out of your neighborhood, right? Citizen could go anywhere they wanted, but like if you were in the, if you were a Roman matron and you were out in the suburra at night, you got what was coming to you because you shouldn't have been there. That was the wrong part of town for a well-to-do lady to be. She shouldn't be, if she was doing there, she's probably doing something up to no good. Because that was the bad part of town. That's where all the hooligans were. Right? So you had distinct social states delineated by where you live in the city, uh, by your social status, and there was expected behavior that went with it. If you were from the Sabura, you were poor, nobody cared about you, because you're the great unwashed. If you lived on the Palatine Hill, obviously you had money because nobody else could afford a house up there. All right, that's in the center of everything. Different areas of the city told you something about them, like it does today, doesn't it? Like, oh, you live in that neighborhood. Yeah, you said money. Okay, let's talk about first century healthcare. We know what the mess of the first century healthcare system. Am I going to stop there? I actually have. Yeah, I got quite a bit more. When do you guys want to stop? I don't want to glaze eyes over more than you can hear in one sitting. Nobody's snoring. Nobody's snoring. Yet. Let's talk about let's talk about the healthcare system in in the Mediterranean. We'll call it a night. And we'll talk about Luke's audience, putting all the pieces together next week. Okay. So hyatros, hi, wrap that, pronounce it wrong. Hyatros is the Greek word for physician, and it was often used parabolically because that word you didn't have that word doctor quite yet. Uh, so you would say, you know, kind of like how we say every dog has his day, or you say, physician, heal thyself. It was more used as figures of speech, the actual word physician. Uh, they worked in the areas of health maintenance and general help, not necessarily in terms of sickness and cure, like we kind of do today. We have all these different things. You know, you have your pain management people, you know, you have a disease specialist, you have a surgeon that fixes damage, whatever. Uh, but back then, basically it was just, you know, kind of keeping your general health okay. Not an idea of, you have this chronic cough, I'm gonna get to the bottom of what the cause is. They didn't have that, right? All right? Doctoring is done through a social network. And Luke, uh, I'm not gonna go there yet. Yeah, doctoring is done through a social network, so it's word of mouth. I know a guy that can that knows what to do with this. But I know a guy who knows a guy whose uncle had that, and he died two weeks later, so don't go to him. Luke's language is going to show us that he considers Jesus' exorcisms to be the healing of illnesses. I'm not saying, oh, there weren't demons and the Jesus cured him of his mental illness. It's not what I'm saying. So listen, kind of see if I can do this carefully. The idea of being tormented by demons and being physically ill in the mind of those people back then, it was the same thing. Again, I'm not saying, oh, demons were mental illness. No. Being afflicted by real actual demons from hell to someone in the first century was no different than being physically ill. It was something that happened. It was normal, it was natural, not normal, it was natural. These things happened. This was something that occurred. People got sick, people got afflicted by demons. Demons are real, they knew what demons were. All right? So I'm not saying, oh, when you say somebody is afflicted by a demon, it just meant they were mentally ill and first century people knew that. No. 
They knew what demons were, and they understood people were afflicted by them, and you need a specialist to cast them out, and people were afflicted by disease, and you could get a physician to help you with that as well. But they didn't make a difference in their mind that, that one kind of affliction was different from another. It was a natural thing, and it needed to be considered. And the, the reason for that is because we don't think this way. The way they thought about moving from impurity to purity, to move from becoming to being, uh, from being able to be something to being something. What kind of foreign concepts to us? Um, and it's hard to even convey. They had just a different thought process. And then parts of the body also had to do with parts of uh, the, what we now know as the mind. So you thought about the heart and the eyes, and it's going to be important because Jesus is going to talk about these kind of things. Luke's going to highlight those words. So he's going to talk about the heart and the eyes. Uh, that is where emotions and fixed thoughts and date collection take place. Data collection take place. So it's your heart and your eyes in the ancient world. This data goes in the eyes and the heart controls emotion and fixates your thoughts and collates all that data you took in. Your hands and your feet, that was for purposeful expression, right? Talk, especially if you talk with your hands. Luke puts, uh, oh, uh, your mouth and your ears, those are the organs of self-expression and speech, right? Then Luke puts heavy emphasis on, uh, again, like I said, the parent patron-client relationship, social relations, economic status, and you're going to see that. Jesus is going to minister to all kinds of people in his gospel. The apostles are going to do the exact same thing. In fact, if you watch, we'll talk about this next week, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts track topically. There's what Jesus did, and here's what the apostles did after him in the same way as they were taught. Right? Kind of neat. And kind of the way one of those, these patron-client relationships is kind of thrown out is that God is God the Father is the patient. The, try that again. God the Father is the patron. Jesus is a broker. The apostles are also brokers. Women are clients and benefactors. It's like, well, what in the world did you just say? So Luke has a particular way of looking at women that we will talk about. Luke's biggest theme is the great reversal, which is also one of the great themes of the New Testament. The big, the big theme of Luke and Acts is the great reversal, right? Jesus came to save sinners. He came to make sinners into saints. Uh, he came to make the blind see, right? To flip things on its ear. You know, he comes to the Pharisees and goes, hey, you, you, you hypocrites. It's like you think you're following the law and you've actually got it all upside down. And the apostles are going to do the same thing as they are preaching in the early church. Right? And as we said earlier, Luke moves from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and Acts moves from Jerusalem to the rest of the land. So that's where we'll leave it for this week. And next week we'll talk about putting all those pieces together and who exactly is this that's listening to this oration. Okay. Questions, comments? Whatever. It's a neat book. There's a lot of stuff. You know, you don't read much of it. We don't read much of it in the lecture. It was surprising, I think. Surprising me, too, when we did the Hebrew study to realize how much of the book of Hebrews actually gets read in church. It's the majority of it. And it's like, man, there's a lot of good stuff. But the book of Acts, not so much. You get it sometime in this long green season after Pentecost spread out through the election. But there's a lot of there's a lot of neat stories and there's a lot of hard stories. You know, like the people that didn't give all the money they said they were gonna to give to the church so they died. That's like that's a hard oh, how do they handle that? So I mean, we'll get all those stories, but there's there's a lot of neat stuff. The book of Acts has got a lot of great stories of the apostles doing some stuff. I don't think it was about the It wasn't. It was about, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It was like a Cain Abel kind of thing. Mm hmm.